All right, I, I, I want to put this back up now that I've challenged it rather strongly. The thing is that people think of reality as one thing. And to take a leaf from the work of Carlos Castaneda when Don Juan talked about the Nagual. And that's an interesting thing to do, grammatic, linguistically. If you call something by a name you don't know, you can give it a meaning all its own. And what Don Juan was saying there was that there was so much more to the world than Carlos could ever possibly absorb that to call it by any name that was known would limit it. And so give him a whole new term. And really, this is a map, right? People respond to their, not to reality, not to reality. People respond to their map of reality, not reality itself. And what I want to suggest is we have their maps. And that also that this reality, whatever it is, is infinite. That used to be earth, air, fire, water, and metal if you were from the Far East, as far as what the world was made of. That was it. Everything was made of earth, air, fire, water, metal. And then we got to a little bit of chemistry. Yeah? And they started to have different elements. We had iron. You make that into steel, which was not an element, but it was made of an element. And you got the other ones, and salt. You got you know, potassium, sodium, and so forth. And then we move further along, and then they get to atoms get to oh, add molecules and atoms. And then you get to protons, neutrons, electrons. And then there are what are these things they're talking about now? The eight different flavors of quarks? Now, in self-slimming. You know, it's, it's realities upon realities, levels upon levels. And what those are, are additional maps. You know, if you're out in the woods, and you're cold, that earth, air, fire, water distinction, that's a pretty good one to have. We need some wood and we need some fire. <laughs> Sometimes it, we use the simple model. Just like people talk about Einstein's theory of relativity. You know, unless you go away from the earth at 100,000 miles a second, it's not really going to matter. <laughs> Newton works just fine locally. And yet, what we can know about the world because of that imagination extends us, creates obviously more possibilities. Now, this idea of distinction theory, uh, I want to give you a little example of it, if I may. And to do this, I need you to imagine that this is empty. It's a void. And if it's total emptiness, how would you know up from down? How would you know which way you were oriented? See, all these things we take for granted, like looking forward, looking back, things are looking up, they're all in relation to other elements, other people. They're relational. They're not by themselves. When you really get the idea, if it was completely empty, you wouldn't be able to know where anything was. And that what we do, and this is from the work of G. Spencer Brown's Laws of Form, is we mark a distinction. And with that little mark, or big mark, I'm going to do that again. G. G. Spencer Brown's, <clears throat> in G. Spencer Brown's Laws of Form, He'd say, we mark a distinction. And with that little mark, how is this now different? Well, there's there and everywhere else. A moment before, there wasn't. You can be here or you can be there. Before that was on there, there was no way to know one from the other. You could look at this and you have foreground and you have background. A moment before you made the distinction, there was no foreground or background. This is how I'm talking about building up the visual field, the visual system. You've heard of these experiments. I, I, they, they're not the friendliest of sounding, but they're quite, quite important in terms of understanding neurology. They'll take two little kittens 
and they'll put the kittens in a room where there's only slats, horizontal light, like you get when you look through a set of blinds. And they'll have one kitten is in a little yoke. I don't know who thinks these up. And the other kitten is a little cart. And the one kitten is pulling the little cart with the other kitten behind that's sitting in the cart. And then they'll test them after a while. And they, they do this gently. And what they'll find is the kitten that walks around will be able to, in that slatted light, to jump up and down from horizontal surfaces on different levels. And the kitten that didn't walk around will stumble right off the edge and won't be able to calibrate where it is. The idea is that the brain is not finished when we arrive, when kittens arrive. And that it's our relationship to our, it's their interaction with that world. Just like these people, the interaction with tradition. That we begin to build up distinctions so that we have, well, if you have a distinction, then that's here and everything else is there. And you're over here, you go, ah, it's over there. If you begin to extend that distinction, a whole nother level of meaning can suddenly occur. There can be above and below. Now, the thing is that this was a theory, a model that was constructed by a mathematician in the 50s and 60s. Now, there's a field called cognitive linguistics that is beginning to demonstrate how deeply this is in our neurology. We are embodying language. Now, what that means is that the way we understand language, the nature of mind, is in direct relationship to how we experience the world. This is very different than the maps and models of Descartes, that mind was some transcendental function, or Plato. When, when Aristotle, for instance, began to figure out logic, he thought this must be how the gods think. Because if you see how people think around you most of the time, they're not using logic. And Aristotle's going, logic, this is, this is inspiration. And so they had this, the mind-body problem. You've heard of this? The mind-body problem is this, that People think the mind came from somewhere else. But what they're finding in this work, these cognitive linguists that include people like George Lakoff, Mark Johnson, many, many others, what they're finding, and this is Eleanor Roche's work called The Embodied Mind, and of course our old friend Francisco Varela showing up again, is that we understand the world because we have a front and a back. We look forward to things because we have convergent vision. This, by the way, is the sign of what? Predator. Convergent vision means you can track prey. If you're a herbivore, an eater of vegetables only, and not by choice, by nature, your eyes are on the side of your head so you can see more predators. In fact, try this on, Ron. The herbivores cannot see what's right in front of them. There's a blank. You can't try it on because our, our eyes converge. I'm tricking you there, but it's pretty weird, isn't it? <laughs> so when the aliens get off the spacecrafts, watch where their eyes are. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, this embodiment, this idea that we look forward to something, that we look back on something, that we are not feeling like ourself today. I don't know who we are, but we're not ourself today. All of these suggest like perceptual positions. They suggest time. In other words, this stuff is grounded in the language of our body, how we experience the world. The distinctions that we make are, first of all, biological. We have upper and lower parts of our body, right? So we have upper and lower our natural kinds of language that we're going to use. And remember how we were younger, we were kind of lower than everything else, weren't we? I mean, just by nature, we had to look up to our parents. And so we hear ourselves saying as adults, wow, you know, I really look up to him or her. And that's that carryover in experience. So there's a, there's a, a window, there's a radio, there's some metaphor here I'm reaching for that lets you know that if you think about the language people are using, 
as expressions of their body, this will help you accelerate the learning of this material. There's a great simplicity in it. As we'd say, it's downright simple. So, a simple distinction, a level, a line. What about we add another one? What's that? What's that? Well, yes, I thought somebody was going to say a square. Well, that's not square. <laughs> but Rachel said in and out. Yes, when you create a bounding condition, fancy word, cognitive linguistics, so forth, when you've got, then you've got an inside and an outside. So children can go outside and play. So we can talk about things like I want to get into a good state. So we said, let's get out of here meaning maybe the place, meaning maybe the state of mind, that we reapply these very basic relationships to the world and we reapply them to our thoughts, to our ideas, to our values. It's how we make sense of the world. It's a distinction. So what if we make more distinctions? Don't get cross. Dividing space up. Ah, oh, he's a consultant. There's four squares. <laughs> the thing is that if this is the visual system, we go on and we make more and more distinctions. And what can we do if we have more and more distinctions? We can describe more precisely. And here we move beyond metaprograms only attached to language. See, there's some of them that are very much subject, perceptual position, verb, activities, time frames, the object, at least at this point, having the form of the content metaprograms of people and place and activities and information and things. And these are biological. And we have something no other species on the planet apparently has. We can abstract out of the moment. We can use language to mark a distinction that is within the biology, but not described with it. Now, for you to understand what I just said, I'm going to have us do an experiment. In order to do this experiment, what I want you to do is to pick some outcome that you have. Now, I'm assuming with your level of training that you know what a well-formed outcome is, that it's stated in the positive, that it's sensory-based, that you have a context in which you want it to occur, that it's something you can do something about, not all about, something about, and that you thought about ecology, the ecology of it, who it will affect, how it will affect you, and that overall, the change will be more of what you want. I would keep you in mind of the goal you pick you will get. Or in the words of the old knight in the Indiana Jones film, choose wisely. <laughs> so right now, as an act of making a distinction, of taking an internal representation and externalizing it, which by the way was the key in all those studies of goal achievement, that they wrote them down, what is that? That's externalization taking an internal representation and making the mark, the distinction on the outside. You could write down what your goal's about. I invite you to do that. More importantly, though, I want you to draw a representation, a picture, that will, you look at the picture, whether it is a picture of the goal, like a car and you see yourself in a car, or whether it's something more of the nature of an experience, a kind of feeling, a kind of capability, because after all, a lot of our goals aren't things, even if English says it that way. What is something you want? Maybe it's not a thing. So maybe your representation is symbolic, a tree, a warm sun, a flower, anything you want. But when you look at it, you go, yeah, that's my goal. That reminds me of my goal. You got the idea here? Do we want to also write this down? If you want to write it down, you can. But I'm much more interested in a picture. I'm so interested in a picture 
I brought blank paper and implements of construction <laughs> and suggest that you actually take time now to do this. It will make a difference in the quality of your learning. So I'll pass some of these around. This is going to require sharing, working, and playing well with others. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. <laughs> 